everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I am thrilled you're here with us today because we have two really special guests, Joshua and Courtney Parrish, founders of Vet Life. Hey, welcome. Thank you for having us on. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thanks for having us. Oh my gosh, we're really excited. You know, we don't have a lot of husband and wives that are founders that work together um, for a nonprofit. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but you bring in a whole nother layer of relationships and life and family when you work together. And so this will be really a fun conversation on a lot of different levels. So many nonprofits in our country start around the kitchen table, as I like to say. And so this is going to be a great conversation. Um, we're going to talk about what happens after you leave the military and what does that look like? Joshua and Courtney have really um, experienced so much and came together and decided that they were going to start a nonprofit to address some of the things that they experienced and things that they saw. And so this is going to be a really robust conversation. Another thing that's robust about the um, the nonprofit show are our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out as we explore all these different issues. Another thing that's really been fabulous, and I hope you've been able to meet some of our new co-hosts. We started debuting them about two months ago. They come from all over the country. They are incredibly diverse in thought, action, and deed. Um, and so really a lot of fun to have these folks joining us and, and being a part of this. Okay, but the meat and potatoes, Joshua and Courtney Parrish, welcome. Let's hear from you. Enough from me. No, thank you so much for having us. I, you know, you mentioned earlier about the husband and wife team and Courtney and I have been together for, you know, almost 20 years now. And so it's amazing that we get to work together and we almost did it by design because we have four kids, we have four children together and we just wanted to give them, you know, a life with their parents that are involved in their life and, and not be away from them 40 to 50 hours a week. Mm -hmm. You know, that's powerful um, because that means that they're part of your, in essence, your staff, your team, your board. I mean, it's a family affair, isn't it? It, it very much is. It very much is. And I, uh, you know, I, I always tell people this, that the backbone of this family is sitting right here next to me. So yeah. Courtney, talk about your journey and and as part of Vet Life today. I mean, being a military wife and a spouse and, and dealing with all that, can you paint a picture of what you've been looking through, the, the lens that you've been looking through? Well, I think families often serve in their own way. They face deployments as well. Um, children learn to go with the flow and navigate transitions, um, often moving, uh, starting new schools. Uh, so that's why we make it a part to include not only the veteran, but the veteran's family in all of our events. Amazing. I've got to ask you this question. Were you at all prepared for this life or, or did you have to learn this on your own? <laughs> I definitely had to learn it on my own <laughs> kind of as we went. And <laughs> Yeah, she's, I will say this, she is a very quick learner. She's got a master's degree in uh, organizational leadership. And so she, um, there you go. She was a natural fit <laughs> for this. And I mean, she just, uh, she, she took something and just completely ran with it. So I love it. Let's back up a little bit before we go any further, Josh, and have you tell us about your military journey. Um, I'm curious, like, is this been a part of your family's ecosystem? Um, did you have other folks in your family that served and, and what did your service look like? That's a great question. So I grew up on a little Native American reservation in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, my dad was the youngest of 13. And most of his brothers uh, served in the military from Korea to Vietnam. 
And so from a very early age uh, on, on an Indian reservation, you, you, you have a sense of family instilled in you. And so when I graduated high school, I, I, I seem to have lost that sense of purpose that I had. And the military just seemed like a natural fit for me. So I joined in 2000 and deployed in 2003 to Iraq for the initial invasion. And one thing they don't tell you when you get home from combat is you can't turn that off. It's nothing is ever going to be the same. It's, it's going to be your new normal. And for me, I thought maybe I was in the minority, uh, but I had lost a sense of purpose and a lot, lost a sense of identity that I really didn't find uh, until Courtney really brought it out in me again to show me that, you know, she always calls me her diamond in the rough. And I, I have a tattoo on, on my body right there uh, <laughs> to signify that because I really don't know where I would have went in life if I, if I wouldn't have been with her. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's powerful. You know, Courtney, that's a lot of responsibility too. Um, to hear your mate say that, uh, I just got to call that out. That's pretty, pretty powerful. And, um, and, and kind of an, drives me to the next piece of this, because you're talking about looking at the ecosystem of the military, looking at how people come back, I mean, from all different types of service. What does this look like to you? And, and why have you all decided that you needed to put part of your focus on this? So I, I struggled um, when I left the military, uh, obtaining my benefits. And you're not really, it's not really explained to you what those benefits are, or where to go to get them. And so I left the military, uh, I ets out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and come back, came back to Michigan. And I thought, hey, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just struggling to find my benefits. And it wasn't until years later that I found out that the military, you know, really doesn't prepare you for what civilian life really is like. So you, you're mandated to go, or you're required to go through a program called TAP, Transition Assistance Program, to acclimate you to civilian life. But really, it's just, a, I think it's a course more to just check the boxes rather than actually prepare you for what life is going to be like uh, post-military. Sure. And with that, is that just done with with the vet, or in in the case of you, you know, Courtney, you didn't have any of that knowledge, right? You didn't have access to that. No, we were all back at home waiting for him to get home. <laughs> right, right, right. So then, in the case of that, how long was it? How long did it take you to figure all of this out? Because you're trying to reassimilate, you're trying to move back, you're you're reintroducing yourself to the family unit, and then on top of all that, you have these issues. How, what does that look like? So I got out in 2008, and Courtney and I moved from the Upper Peninsula down to the Lower Peninsula, and she was working for a university, and she sent me an email one day, and she said, "Hey, there's they're hiring in the county that we live in." for a county department of veterans affairs office and we had lived here a few years and i had no idea what that was so i put my name in i found out later uh, there was 120 applicants and they picked me for the job well my first day on the job it really exposed me to what i feel the you know the inefficiencies in the system are and that's that we expect the veteran to come to us, the government, to find their benefits, but we don't prepare them or educate them on where to go to get those benefits. And so it was probably four years after I left the military before I stumbled on what my benefits were. And even then I was so hard headed. She was the one that made me apply for the benefits for VA healthcare, for disability compensation, for, for education benefits. And so I don't even, honestly, I don't even know if I would have applied for them because the military instills like a sense of hardness in you that you don't ask for help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's um, not to be negative, 
but the the military doesn't have an incentive to be paying out these benefits at, at the same time is right you know right i mean it's an economic issue as well i mean i think sometimes in society and in business even the harder we make it it's a strategy if no, that makes sense that makes perfect sense i mean think about yeah. it this way the military has invested in you as a, a soldier you know they've put money to to shape you into becoming something so it doesn't necessarily benefit them uh when you leave the military so they, i think they're more invested in keeping you in as long as they can as opposed to that you know kind of post military civilian life sure absolutely it makes sense i mean it, it's also a, a business model we see that right now in, in the nonprofit sector we are losing too many people they're retiring they're getting burnt out you know they're going into the for-profit sector and then all that energy knowledge and wisdom evaporates right mm -hmm. and so yeah i think it's it's kind of a, a truism if you will let's move on to this next issue and in and, and this i'm so interested courtney as a mother why focus on the family first like what does that look like to you and and uh it's not what i think most of us would think we think oh you focus on the vet first what does this look like to you i feel like that's what sets us apart from other organizations so many focus solely on the veteran and we wanted to involve their whole family in all of our events and programs we invite the spouses the children it's set up for the whole family unit and not just the veteran. Yeah. I noticed that I, I didn't, I watched several of the videos that you have on your website um, talking about, you know, the different coverage that you'd had and where, where it was showing your events and all that. And I was stunned two things. One that it had so many families and I felt like it was, you know, the moms and the dads and the, the adult siblings, but oh my God, the families were so young, the vets, children, and, and, you know, the little, little kids, little kids, um, that the trajectory of their parents' experience and is I, very real. I do have to brag here for a moment because I don't quote me on the date, but I believe it was around 2018, the, the VA had put out an email asking for ideas on how to improve the quality of life for veterans and their families. And Courtney submitted our vet fest idea that we had started the year previous. And it took a few years, but then the VA reached back out and asked if they could replicate that on a national model. So in 2023, they took our model and they've replicated our vet fest in all 50 states amazing wow well good for you that's really something to be proud of and uh you know if you watch the video um from vetlifetoday.org i can see why that would be something that's so attractive because uh it looks like such a cool thing to do for a community um and so let's talk about that joshua with you and in, in terms of your perspective you come back from combat from an incredibly different 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 and difficult part of the country um how does did that look to you to have things shifted towards the family and maybe not so much on you so you know it was rough coming back yeah so you know what they don't tell you is that you know you're going to see white cars that you're gonna think have bombs in them because that's in Iraq. They just have white cars with like an orange stripe on them. They don't tell you that you're just gonna, you know, scan the room when you walk into it to, to look for threats. And, and you can't turn that kind of stuff off. And then I tried to go back to school when I got back from Iraq and I just didn't fit in. I, I mean, everybody that I encountered just didn't understand me. So. I really fell back on my family because, you know, at the end of the day, they're the ones that are with me through, you know, thick and thin, you know, the good times and the bad times. And so when we first started talking about vet life, uh, that had to be the sole really focus was making sure that the, the family unit was involved in the process. Mm -hmm. As you started and you, you kind of rethought formulated what you wanted to do and um 
what your mission was. Did you get a lot of support from other folks around you and um, vets or were people like, what? I don't get this. Why do we need this? I mean, what was the the uh, feedback that you received? Because it's not an easy thing to start a nonprofit. And I would imagine that that there was probably some pushback. Yeah, more from some of the veteran service organizations um, where, you know, back in the day, Vietnam era, it was just, uh, they would joke that it was kind of a good old boys club where you would go to have a drink to get away from your wife or your kids. And so when we started doing Vet Fest, we invited all of these organizations to be resource providers really by design because we wanted them to see how the quality of life improved for the veteran and their family by just having them there. And the metrics we tracked, you know, really support our hypothesis on this. So we're seeing uh, 87% of the people that attend our VetFest event stay the entire four hour time period. Amazing. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more because I'm fascinated. I mean, we see a competitive mindset in the nonprofit sector. I mean, in, in, you know, people doing the work of the angels, but if you have a food bank in one part of town, sometimes I think there can be a sense that the, the food bank on the other side of the town is competing with you and all that. How did the veterans services um, from the government to other organizations welcome you or support you or how did they interact and how do they interact with you now? Um, I, I can take this question. Um, so I think what sets us apart from other nonprofits is that uh, think of us as like a central coordinating nonprofit where we're bringing the resources down to connect the veterans to those benefits. So, you know, our business model is pretty simple. You know, if you build it, they will come. And so we bring the veterans and their families down to the same area as where the resource providers are. And then we just make it fun. We have live bands, we have bounce houses, we have prize giveaways, we have celebrities that will come. And Courtney created this um, uh, Operation Backpack where every year at VetFest, we give away somewhere between two to 300 backpacks filled with school supplies. I love it. Courtney, do you think that your education in organizational management prepared you for this? I mean, because it's such an interesting dynamic to have a good idea, identify a problem, create a mission, but then land in an ecosystem all of itself. I mean, you're talking about government, you're talking about, you know, so many different, um, if you will, inputs or situations that most nonprofit organizers would never find themselves in. Talk to us about that. The diversity has, but I think it was more so the family aspect mm. that it's it's often the spouse or the brother or sister or somebody who's pushing the veteran to get their benefits. And by having their them there with them, they're saying, "Hey, honey, why don't you come over and look mm -hmm. at this table or look at this?" <laughs> and interesting. Or even the kids going over to get <laughs> the free candy and right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she. Uh, <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll just mention this because this is this is really funny. Um, so she just told me one day she's like, "Hey, I think you should go back to school." So I said, "Okay, I'll go back to school." And then she's like, "Oh, I think you should go to law school." Oh, okay, I'll go to law school. <laughs> and you know, and she just gently coerced me into you know how she wanted me to be because I feel like she saw the potential there. So yeah, I, I echo that sentiment and I, I'm wondering if any other veterans and their families are listening right now that can really uh, attest to that, uh, that it's really the spouse that is gently pushing the veteran to get their benefit. Sure. Well, I think it's a really interesting thing because people um, like myself or people that don't really understand um, the veteran culture or have family members involved, uh, my sense of it would be, you know, you leave service and okay, here you go. And this is what we'll do. And not that other direction that you have to advocate for yourself. Your family has to advocate for you. I find that horrifically challenging, to be honest with you. Yeah. And can you imagine the veterans out there that are just going at it at alone? I mean, you know, we're, we're open to the veteran and the family, um, but, you know, I want to 
create, we want to create an atmosphere where everybody feels welcome, you know, black, white, orange, yellow, male, female, it doesn't matter. We just want you at our event because we want you to know that there are people out there that care about you and want to see you be the most successful version of yourself. Right. It's so powerful. Talking about this and, and you know, the breakdowns and transition from military to civilian life, um, you've identified so many things. And I, I was so moved, um, Josh, by the sense of your mission and your place and your duty. And then you come home and it's all upside down and you're trying to re navigate this. Um, what have you seen aside from um, just the normal transition in your lifetime now going through other wars, going through other social and unrest and things going on? What are you seeing? Because has it always been like this, like from, you know, the Korean veterans in modern times all the way up? Or is this a unique time? What do you see? No, so Courtney and I always say that we never want to uh, replicate Vietnam again. So I want you to think a Vietnam veteran got out and then just immediately fell through the cracks. Okay. Well, I think we have an opportunity now. What we need to do and what her and I are doing, we've created a few different uh, apps. Um, so veterans need to understand what their benefits are. That's the biggest breakdown. Uh, and then gaining instantaneous access to their military records. Because believe it or not, you actually have to prove that you were injured on active duty combat and you have to supply documents to show that you were injured. So her and I created this uh, app called Battle Buddy that brings all of the vetted resources down. So if you want to get a home loan, if you want to go back to school, if you want disability, if you want health care, you know, you name it, it's a one stop shop. And then really the brains behind the My Veteran Records, which is what we'll talk about here in a sec, is it's a patient portal for your veteran records. And so we can actually scan all of your records in digitally because believe it or not, here in the state of Michigan, until her and I advocated the legislature, all military records were in paper form, somewhere in microfiche. So we actually had to go to the legislature and say, listen, you got to digitize these records because really your records are your Bible. You know, your just mm -hmm. papers prove if you want to get any benefits, you have to have access to those. And right now there's still a 12 to 15 month backlog if you try to request those military records. Wow. Okay. That blows my mind. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, gosh, I mean, you've got my mind going so many directions. Um, first of all, I had no idea. And second of all, um, without that support, I mean, and if you're any, if you're diminished, if you have injuries, how do you navigate this unless you have somebody guiding you or helping you? It's astonishing. So I, I'm a big research person. So I started combing through the VA's auditor general reports and I found that, so an accredited veteran service officer is supposed to be your conduit, the person that guides you to your benefits. Well, across the country on average, for every 7,402 veterans, there's only one accredited veteran service officer. So that's why it's, we need to automate this service. It, it's not a matter of, you know, if we should, it's just a matter of it needs to be done now because these men and women are literally, as we're speaking right now, are falling through the cracks and probably will never access their benefits. Right. This is a shocking thing to learn and to hear and and to digest at the same time when you're also dealing with families under duress. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know, you're dealing with people that are coming back with uh, physical, mental, spiritual issues that how do they navigate this if they don't have that help? I mean, it's it's astonishing to hear this. Well, her and I, um, during COVID, when everybody was in lockdown, I had put out on LinkedIn that I knew people were struggling, you know, especially with the social isolation. Yeah. And somebody had reached out and I had said, you know, if you need to go for a walk, talk, anything you want, well, I took a veteran for a walk around a local park and we just walked for an hour, two hours. And then afterwards, we're sitting on this bench and he looks over to me and he goes, 
and I'm just being you know completely transparent here. He said, I was thinking about ending my own life because no, I didn't think anybody else cared about me. I've been out of the military for a while and you're the first person that has actually shown some type of kindness and empathy towards me. Wow, that's powerful. Well, it has been such a, a really interesting conversation. Um, I will say this conversation didn't go the direction that I thought. Um, you know, a lot of times our viewers and listeners might not know this, but the process of getting on the nonprofit show, we have a, you know, a process and a procedure and everything. We've been doing this for five years. We've done over 1100 shows. Um, we don't meet uh, our, our guests, you know, necessarily in advance. Um, and so this has really been a shock. I, I learned so much from you that I feel like I should have known. No, it's okay. And, and so really, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, the story behind the formation of nonprofits is always so emotional. Mm -hmm. It's always so central to somebody's uh, core beliefs. And Joshua and Courtney Parrish, wow, you embody that so much. Um, you know, check out vetlifetoday.org. Uh it's an amazing site and you can watch different things and see what they're doing. And I'm sorry, I think we're having a little bit of feedback problems on our sound. Um, so stick with us. But Joshua Parrish, Courtney Parrish, founders of Vet Life, thank you so much for your service to all of us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. It's been great. Um, really quickly, your next Vet Life event is coming up shortly, right? August 10th here in Michigan. Uh, and it's funny you mention that because we've had veterans from all 83 counties over the years attend the events, and we've had veterans from out of state that will come to our event. I bet. I would imagine that you're going to have, as you grow and you become more known, you're going to have other vet organizations come and witness or monitor your event to learn mm -hmm. from it, right? Yeah. If that's not already happening, because it's so successful. Yeah, it's been, it's like I said, it's been replicated by the VA. Um, so we're in all 50 states. You know, we don't physically run that event, but they asked for the blueprint on how to run it. And then here in Michigan, yeah, we've had probably four or five other organizations, a few universities that have uh, replicated our event. And, you know, we say this kind of to just wrap things up, you know, at the end of the day, if it's helping veterans and it's good for the cause, we will support it. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that is the, I think that's the benevolent um, attitude at the core, right? You're not trying to uh, put a moat around your, your event and your organization. You're trying to let it grow. And, and uh, that's really powerful. That, that makes me love your organization even more because we don't hear that enough, right? <laughs> we tend to want to hold on our, hold on to our own cheese and not share. So Good, good, good job. Hey, everybody, this has really been a delight. I hope you get to share this, the content and uh, with somebody that works in veteran services or um, works in their own community where this might be something to take a look at. Another thing I want to make sure is that we have amazing support from our sponsors that allow us to have conversations like this, unscripted, really authentic, genuine conversations. And our supporters include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these riveting conversations like we've had with the parishes and their family today. It's been amazing. Okay, you two, I can only imagine how busy you are, so we're going to let you go. But uh, we're going to include you on this way that we end each and every episode. And today it means something different. It means something different to me every day I say it. But today I'm really taking it into my heart in a different way. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. <laughs>